probably it takes uh, as long as to drink two Bloody Marys to mm -hmm. by the time the eggs are done. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Oh, hell, That's honey. Way more than you need. It was just a family business. It's where my father worked, where my uncle Francis and my uncle Leslie worked, where my male cousins worked when they were old enough to hold a job. It was just always there. You know, where else can you buy an item for 20 bucks that can cook anything and everything and last a lifetime? Some are old, some are new. What's your favorite piece in here? Oh, I don't know. I cook with this one. I cook with that one on the other room. I don't really have a favorite piece. I just have pieces. I like this hammered one because it's unique. But all of these I just I bought. I got into the buying mode. Joseph Lodge was born in 1848 in eastern Pennsylvania. Joseph Lodge married Anna Elizabeth Harvey in 1877. They had two children, Richard Leslie Lodge, born in 1883. His older sister was Edith Harvey Lodge. She married Charles Richard Kellerman in 1908. Now, Richard Leslie married Aunt Betty in England, and they had two children, twins, John and Beth. John grew up to be an Episcopal priest. He had four children, one of whom is Henry Lodge, who's working at Lodge today as CEO. There were other brands making cast iron at the turn of the century, and there were other brands that were selling it. But Lodge was consistent, and, and they kept making it, uh, and they didn't stop making it. It starts at the foundry and with the family, and it starts in town, and it really emanates from there. And I think if you talk to home cooks and if you talk to professional cooks, they feel the same love for Lodge. We're not your grandmother's Cracker Barrel, but we are, because there's something very powerful about that, that you are um, so rooted in tradition, but yet you are still moving forward. Lodge is that way as well. They're rooted in tradition. They have that quality that's been around, and you know you can trust it, and the future generations are discovering it. When you were uh, ran the Olympic torch, do you remember in Memphis? Yeah, when... Uh... Lodge was did the logo skillet for the uh, 2002 Winter Games in Salt Lake City. Right, right. We were the first cookware to be licensed, uh, you know. Right, and they ask you ask you to run the torch. And my favorite part, of course, is I was saying you've got to practice. This thing is heavy, so I made you run up and down the road with the skillet in your hand. Yeah. So you could practice holding that weight. With an eight-inch skillet to weigh yeah. three pounds the weight <laughs> of the torch. I had spent my childhood years down at the foundry on Saturday mornings. Uh, we would go down to the office uh, with my father and watch Sky King and uh, black and white TV and get Cokes for a nickel and uh, work during, in the summers at the foundry loading trucks. 
That's back before we even put skillets in a box. We uh, ran a piece of wire down through the handle and threw them on the truck. So I wanted to build our brand back since my early 20s. But the best thing to ever happen was uh, marrying uh, Cheryl, my wife. And that was before we seasoned anything. And they would season all those skillets before they left the store, which I thought was pretty amazing. Make sure their customers knew what they were doing. As trends changed and as people started looking to aluminum and looking to stainless steel, you know, I think one of the things that's been great about Lodge is that they've just been consistent. And now there's a whole cast iron craze happening and, and you know, they're building new foundries to support the business. But I think it speaks to their steadiness uh, and the durability of their product that uh, they never went away. If you treat people well, they will also treat you well. And I find that to be the case at Lodge Cast Iron. Goodness knows we have our days. <laughs> but we act with, I think we try to be fair and, and act with integrity all the time. I got a call from the, my cousin, Dick Kellerman, at the foundry, and he said, uh, we just fired our shipping clerk. You know how to do that job. Get your, you know what, down here. And I said, OK, I'm coming, but I'm not staying. We used three raw materials in the process, iron, steel, pig iron. I don't think the company was ever about making money per se. I think we've been about, and hope we still are about, providing a good, honest, steady job to the people in this area and helping to support three, four hundred families at any one time over the years. I guess it was really late high school or even college uh, when I kind of started putting the pieces together that. Uh, it'd been in the family for, you know, since 1896, uh, and it was a big part of what the family was all about. In 1965, Dick Kellerman determined to start automating the foundry and put in uh, diesel which had been invented in Switzerland. And you know the history of the diesel is they made machine guns during World War II, and after the war, they had to find something else to do. And so they developed the diesel molding machine, pouring machine, and my father heard about it. He and my brother went up to Milwaukee to see the second one in the world, and they decided to buy one. Transfer ladle, we're about to get a good show here. Well, in, in the foundry industry, Whenever you're transferring iron from one place to another, pouring it in molds, you get a little reaction that creates all these kind of sparks. In the foundry industry, at least when I came here, what I learned was they're called yellow jackets. This is a hammered finish. This is a unique skillet that Bob may be bringing back into production. You can see the finish there. Here's one that doesn't have a name on it, made by the Hunter molding equipment. This one has a Y for the molder mark. This one we can't see the molder's mark on. This is a good place you can kind of look inside the machine and see uh, how it works, what happens when it makes a 
hole, there's a piston that goes in and out of the machine. And on, on that piston is mounted one side of the pattern. And there's also what we call a sink plate that drops down and closes. Uh, and it's got the other side of the pattern on it. Sand is blown down from above into that cavity and then compressed very hard. These machines can make about 400, uh, between 380 and 400 molds per hour. And this is Bubba's kingdom. He's in control. We put iron in this auto core and uh, it fills it up and then we want to pour the iron out. We apply air pressure and the iron goes out into the pouring trough. When that mold gets in the right position, then the auto pour will automatically let iron slow down into the mold. But if anything needs to be adjusted, Bubba will take care of it. Thank you, Bubba. So again, getting back to the family issue, when my cousin Dick Kellerman was one of the three Kellerman brothers running the business at that time, when he called and said, you know how to do this, we need you, I couldn't say no. I mean, I just, I'm not, I couldn't do that. It's family, it's a business. Uh, but I talked to Dick Kellerman and, and also his brother, Leslie, who was one of the other three brothers. And I told him, I remember Leslie particularly said, Okay, so here's the way we understand it. We don't have to keep you, you don't have to stay. I said, that sounds like a deal. The piston that was going in and out of the machine, this heavier part would be on that. And this would be on the swing plate we looked at and it would, it would come down and close the mold. I guess just over a pretty short period, I fell in love with what I was doing, I fell in love with the people I was doing it with and with the company as a whole, and I felt a tie to it and never really seriously considered anything else after, after a few months of that. It was the right thing to do at the time, you know, and you do what you have to do. And I, you know, once I embraced it, I said, I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna grow this business and, uh, so it's, it's happened and it's made me very happy. So now we've arrived at the uh, finishing area. First step is cleaning the cast and getting you that baked on sand off. So we've got, we've got three cleaning systems, three cleaning lines. So the fellows up here went on, are on what we call the sorting conveyor. So they know at their particular station what cast needs to come off to run down that cleaning line. Anybody in the production line can pull a piece off, off the line if they think there's a flaw in it. It may be a blemish as so, small as a pinhead in the surface of the skillet. It's the Joe Lodge legacy. You do a good job at what you're doing. It does, looking back, seem like somewhat of an overnight success. What I've always heard about success it's, it's when preparation meets opportunity, and we were prepared. When I first came here in 2001, you sort of wanted to play down the fact that you were from the South. It wasn't cool. Somewhere along the way, the, um, that has changed, and it changed in the, I'm guessing, 2007, 8, and 9, somewhere around in there. The family has always, as owners, has always been very willing to let us reinvest our income and our profits in, back in the company. You've got to have expensive equipment. You, there's just a lot of, of capital that needs to be continually reinvested in the company. Authenticity of the South, it resonates. I think a bunch of chefs have come out of the South, done lots of exciting things with Southern cuisine all over the country. And now it is probably the most sought after kind of chef food around. It's just all of a sudden become way cool. 
we had realized that the, one of the big disadvantages as, as we went through generations and generational changes is that the younger folks coming on didn't understand seasoning. What, what was this seasoning thing? Salt, pepper, what kind of seasoning did you use? Whereas my parents' generation, particularly in the South, I mean, that was the, where cast iron had its biggest strength. They got all that. We realized that if we could season our product before we put it in a box, it would be a huge, huge advantage, not necessarily a competitive advantage, but, but people would not have to worry about, well, I don't, I, I don't want to buy cast iron because I got to do this stuff to it. We were not prepared for how fast we grew. We were prepared for the market to embrace us. It did in a much bigger way than we expected. Almost all the media wanted to tell the story of here's this cast iron cookware company in Tennessee that's been making cookware for 120 years and, and now they've revolutionized cast iron and they've made it much easier for you. After that, we also started joining all the chef organizations and making friends with chefs and making sure the culinary programs in the country had cast iron so they could find out about cast iron if they didn't know about it. Yeah, if you go to any restaurant anywhere and they've got a piece of cast iron that has the teardrop handle, not like this one, you immediately want to pick it up and look to see what's on the bottom. Does it say Lodge or is it somebody else? <laughs> We've done that in Venezuela and in Alaska. With Bob running sales and marketing and me running operations, over the years it went back and forth. Bob, we've got plenty of production. Get your butt busy and get us some sales. And he'd do that to the point where he'd go, OK, Henry, we've got more sales than we can produce. Get me some production. So Bob, and we the, the burden is back on you now. <laughs> about the tens of thousands of hours that have gone into, you know, the manpower, the brain power, the technology out here in the new foundry. Oh, it's right, just yeah. uh, yeah. mind boggling. Never entered my mind that in, in our lifetimes we would be able to build a greenfield foundry. I know. And, it uh, gives me goosebumps every time <laughs> I'm out there. And to see it actually go up now today, seeing it in production, it's, yeah. uh, it doesn't get much better than this. No, it doesn't. What changes? Uh, new equipment, more capacity, better packaging. I came in 2001. It was sort of my job to try and make cast iron hip again. And so, 16 years later, I, I think we did. <laughs> now, if we can just keep it there. <laughs> I think we're gonna grow. Uh, I think we've had a really sharp, sharp increase in the last few years. Don't expect that to continue. Um, but I think cast iron has been around for a lot of years. It's getting so popular, there are a lot of competitors out there. But again, if we focus on how do we make sure we can take care of our employees with solutions that are, work in the marketplace, we'll find 
things we don't even know about today that are going to help keep our company going. Just keeps getting bigger and better, you know. Cast iron is like women and whiskey. It gets better with age and the company as well. So it's uh, been a long ride. If Joe Lodge came back today, he would have one of two reactions. Wow, I never imagined that the little company I started would grow into this and, and he would be excited and pleased or he'd come back and he'd say, what have you done to my nice little company? What have you done to it? It's huge, it's taking over, to, it's doing all these. So I hope it would be the, the former, not the latter. I think he'd be pleased. To deal with people that you trust and that you know come to the table every day with a really good business and fair business sense is an honor.